Hello, this is Dr. Jenkins. We are here to introduce and go through how you're going to complete the grocery store lab. As you're going to hear me say later on, this is something that you can do at the actual grocery store or you can do it from home. So either way, let's just jump right in. Okay, so we have an outline here. We're going to review some things as we always do because the more we go through it, uh, the better off we are at getting it into your brain cells. And then I'm gonna go through how to actually complete the lab. Make sure that you review the three energy systems that our muscles will use to create energy. Now, we remember that the usable energy source for muscles is ATP. If we're going to utilize glucose or utilize fats, we have to convert them into ATP because adenosine triphosphate or ATP is the usable energy source. And you can see that's why on this far right column, in terms of energy yield, we talk about it in terms of ATP. The first energy system that our muscle cells go to for energy is something called the phosphocreatine, PCR, or sometimes it's also referred to as the intramuscular high energy phosphate. Don't let the big words fool you. It's just a series of chemical reactions. And what these series of chemical reactions do is they give our muscles immediate energy. So for the first couple seconds that you're exercising, this is how your muscles are getting ATP. And this process is anaerobic, which means that it does not require oxygen. And that's why it can happen so quickly. But if you exercise for longer than a few seconds, which most of us do, then you're gonna need to generate more ATP. And the second series of chemical reactions or the second energy system that we use is something called anaerobic metabolism, or it's sometimes called anaerobic glycolysis. This is gonna provide additional energy. You can see here it says additional five to 15 seconds, depending on what source you read. It may even say up to an additional 60 seconds. But we can suffice to say up to a minute or so. This is also anaerobic. But if we're still exercising after a minute or 90 seconds or so, then we begin to create ATP the third way, which is called aerobic metabolism. And it's called aerobic metabolism because it does require oxygen. Make sure you know these in order. Make sure you know when they're used and whether they are aerobic or anaerobic. Excellent. Review of the fuel sources. In other words, what's being converted into ATP? We just went through these chemical reactions that are producing ATP, ATP, ATP. But what's going into these to create ATP? Carbohydrates, fat, or protein? Well, let's talk about it. The first thing that your muscle cells are gonna use is glucose and they'll just take some glucose right from the bloodstream. Then we will utilize stored glycogen. We'll break that glycogen back down into glucose. And as you already know, we store glycogen in two places. Two thirds of all of our glycogen is scored, stored in the skeletal muscle and the remaining third or so is stored in the liver. And then we burn fat. We burn protein only as a last resort Remember we said maybe, I don't know, 5 to 15% of all of our energy, our ATP comes from protein, not very much. And I also want to point out that after the initial onset of exercise, pretty quickly, we're burning a carbohydrate fat mixture. But at the very beginning of exercise, at the immediate onset, we use only glucose and our muscles will as quickly as they can start to burn fat. So inevitably, we're burning some kind of carb fat mixture. If it's a shorter high intensity activity, we're gonna be doing many more carbs and less fat. If it's a 
lower intensity, long duration exercise, we'll be burning more fat with a little bit less carbohydrate. What a great review this is. This is a nice way to talk about the type of exercise and then what is used for exer- what is used as a um, to convert into ATP for energy. We don't use much protein, folks. We tend to burn a carbohydrate fat mixture. Okay. Last thing to review would be the respiratory exchange ratio. We've already talked about this in the lecture, but this is the volume of CO2 that is produced divided by the volume of oxygen that is consumed. Literally, when you do the math, and we'll have a lab on this later this semester where we put someone on a treadmill and we measure these gases. And when we do the math, so per minute, we get a, a volume of CO2 produced and we get a volume of oxygen consumed. We do the math, we get a number. If they're the same, our respiratory quotient, or RER, we can use those terms interchangeably, is 1.0. And make sure you know these numbers, folks. At an RQ of 1.0, your muscles are burning 100% carbs. At an RQ of 0.85, you're burning 50% carbs, 50% fat. And at an RQ of 0.7, you're burning all fats. Okay, let's get into today's lab. I'm excited. Okay, you're gonna start this lab by picking an athlete. Pause the video, pick the athlete that you want. It does not matter which one you pick. There's important data that you're gonna need to know. You're gonna need to know the age, the gender, the height, the weight, and then the level, intensity, duration, and level of their exercise or their as an athlete. For whoever you pick, you're going to have to go through a series of recommendations. Based on the athlete that you pick, you're going to pick an activity factor from this table. I'm gonna go back. I suppose I'm biased because I'm a female, but let's just say I pick athlete number one, 32 year old female, marathon runner, but she competes recreationally. She's not a professional. So if I'm doing a marathon runner, that would be considered endurance. So I know I'm gonna wanna pick a number between this range. And being that she's a recreational runner, I'm gonna go right in the middle. So I'm gonna pick an activity factor of 2.0. If she was a more competitive marathon runner, maybe I would go higher. Maybe I'd pick 2.2. If she was a professional, 2.4. Next, you're going to calculate how many calories they need per day. This time we're going to be using an equation, and you're going to only use one equation. You're going to use the equation that matches your athlete. So the athlete I picked was a 32-year-old female, so I'm going to pick this one. For whatever one you pick, I just gave this as an example, uh, remember order of operations, you're going to do the things in parentheses first. It's going to ask for your weight in kilograms. To convert into kilograms, you're going to take the weight in pounds and divide by 2.2 to get the weight in kilograms. So let's say the weight in kilograms is 70, that I would do this multiplication first. So 70 times 15.3, whatever that number is, I get that number up here. I'm really not good at math on the fly. I'm just gonna put number. <laughs> then I'm gonna add that to 679. Okay, and that's gonna give me a number. Then I'm gonna multiply that number by the activity factor that you chose. So I chose two. Okay, make sure you do it in the correct order. And that's gonna get you the total number of calories that this athlete needs per day. The last thing you're gonna have to do is you're going to have to choose a percentage of carbs, percentage of fat, and a percentage of protein for your athlete. Remember what the AMDRs, e AMDRs are. That's a tongue twister. We know that somewhere between 45 and 65% of our diet should come from carbs. We know that somewhere between 20 and 35% of our diet should come from fat. 
we know that somewhere between 15 and 30 percent should come from protein you're going to choose numbers and there's not necessarily one right answer you just have to be thinking and using some common sense so if i'm going to use the endurance athlete that was the just for example's sake don't use my numbers as i'm recording this i'm thinking please don't use the same exact numbers that i do actually you know what? i'm going to choose myself because i don't want to give anything away i want you to have to think about it so i'm going to use myself i'm a cyclist um of a certain age and i compete pretty recreationally but kind of competitively so we're going to say low to moderate competition level When I'm out there, there's no joke, fool. Or no joke. It's high effort. All right. So as an endurance athlete, I'm probably going to go towards this side. So maybe I say I need 60% carbs. As an endurance athlete, I'm going to need a pretty decent amount of fat. So maybe I say 25% fat. And if I add that up, 60 plus 25 is 85 that leads me with 15% protein because whatever you pick needs to add up to 100. Okay? You, you might initially do this and think, you know what, that protein seems kind of low. So I want to up the protein. Maybe I choose this to be 18% or even 20. We could do 20 probably. So I want this to be 20 so I gotta take away five from somewhere else. So I take away two and a half from each of these. So I do 22 and a half, and then I do 57 and a half. So you see what I mean? It just needs to make sense. You're going to remember what you picked. All right. So now you're gonna go to the grocery store or you can do it from home. There's another video that you'll see on Blackboard that uh, there's a link on Blackboard to the YouTube video that shows me uh, explaining how to use the MyFitnessPal phone app. So you can either scan foods using the little scan on the MyFitnessPal app, or you can enter them in by hand. Either way, your goal is just to make a reasonable diet. You want your diet to come as close as you can to meeting the number of calories. So let's say that I needed 2,500 calories, and that's my goal. I'm gonna be adding food to that day of my fitness pal until I get close to 2,500. Is it gonna be exactly 2,500? No, but you can get it pretty close. But also, as you use that, that My Fitness Pal app, you're gonna be able to check on these percentages of carbs, fat, and protein. In the video, I show you how to access it. On my fitness pal, you'll see a bar graph like this. It's under other on the menu and then nutrition and then you click on macros. But as you're going through, you can see the percentages. Now, I should have taken a better picture of this but there would be a, a percentages listed on the side where it would be like 59% was from carbs, that green color. And then it'll say 19% from protein, which is the purple. So it'll give you a list of whatever it is, right? But you can look at this pie chart as you're working. So it's not uncommon that people do a, a, a daily day. They go for breakfast, banana oatmeal they go through lunch peanut butter and jelly trail mix apple then they go through dinner whatever they want for dinner they put some snacks they put water and they see that maybe they're really close to their calorie goal but then when they look at the pie chart they have way too much fat and way too little carbs so you're going to have to go back and change change some things to try and get close to whatever it was that you came up with a couple of tips, when you're putting food into MyFitnessPal, you can change 
the serving size. So for some of these athletes, it can be difficult to get enough calories in. So one strategy to meet a higher amount of calories is to include more serving sizes because really we tend to have more than one serving size of foods and for many of them it's okay. When you do your diet, you can also be reasonable if they want a cookie or whatever, be reasonable. But I really don't want to see, you know, five guys, burger and fries, fried Oreo cookies, you know. Make sure that you add fruits and vegetables. Usually when we do this lab on campus or when we actually go to the grocery store, someone comes to me and there's literally no fruit or vegetables and I send them right back out, okay? So when you're done, you'll see in your lab assignment sheet, I'm gonna ask you to record what you had, and then you're gonna tell me what your recommendations were and then what your actual was for total calories, percent carbs, fat, and protein. This is meant to be just an exercise in practice. Uh, you're not a dietitian, neither am I for that matter. Um, but I think it's very useful, even the just practicing going out there, having to actually think about these things and then go and create a sample diet and then trying to get it to match the right or nearly the right amount of carbs, fat, and protein. I think we can learn some things and it can be surprising, um, but also good practice. All right, off you go.